Indie Beacon Radio with host B. Allen Bourgeois. Welcome to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. You can send questions for each show on Twitter using the hashtag Indie Beacon. Now sit back and enjoy learning about our guest for this show. And welcome to Indie Beacon Radio. I am your host, B. Allen Bourgeois. And today we have with us Jerry Reedy, who has written a very interesting story book called The Vegas Night. And so welcome, Jerry. Well, thank you, Alan. So let's start off with what made you get into writing? Uh, well, uh, I didn't really want to get into that part of it, but what got into writing was uh, I experienced um, uh, not only a fun, exciting, dangerous uh, thing in my 20s, and I was trained by a guy uh, that just, uh, uh, I, I think he was a genius, uh, never was brought out that way, but he uh, uh, trained us to cheat at blackjack in Las Vegas. And uh, even though I was raised by a Marine and, and uh, a true blue American guy, baseball player through college, uh, raised a family since then, I've never had any trouble, but that's what I did in my 20s. A man trained me to do it, and he uh, uh, came to an early demise in his life, and I just uh, felt a passion, a, 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 a real passion to write a book about the man. Okay, so it's focused more on him versus what you actually did, or a combination of both? A combination of both. Uh, he was a leader, a mentor. Uh, he was uh, all eight or ten years older uh, than I was, and he trained a young group of guys uh, to be experts at casino espionage. So, and, and that's I mean, what just about. saying that right there doesn't kind of le give the idea to people that he is a mentor or a good guy. I mean, he's cheating at the casinos. So, yeah, uh, that was something that uh, that we all had to uh, uh, set a moral compass about. Um, it was more of a competition to us. It became a, a cat and mouse game with the authorities. They knew who we were. We knew who they were. Um, it was a deal where we came back week after week for five years to Las Vegas. And it was a, it was a unit. It was a team. It was camaraderie. Uh, we lived in San Diego during the week and uh, traveled back and forth to Las Vegas via the boss's airplane. He was also a, a pilot. Okay. So, I mean, doing this week after week for five years, clearly you are pushing the boundaries of and wanting to get caught. The man, when he trained his first crew, and this is an ongoing crew, which the faces and the names changed throughout the five years. When I first met the man, I went down flat broke. Uh, he handed me $500 and began teaching me basic strategy and blackjack. It wasn't until a couple of days later that he showed me uh, how, how they won their money. And I was totally shocked at the time. Uh, tears running out of my eyes going, what I get myself into? Uh, he nurtured us along. I was, I joined the crew the same time another 20 year old kid did and he couldn't play until he turned 21. And he was from the Northwest. He was from Idaho. We're still friends to this day. Uh, but we were trained by this guy. He took us under his wing and nurtured us along and we became very competitive, uh, very tough to deal with uh, for the Las Vegas authorities. And so after uh, years and years of this, uh, of course, Las Vegas are no dummies. Uh, they started catching on. And we became more aggressive where we went in, played 10 or 15 hands and ran out. And so this book depicts a bunch of young guys just cinching up the belt one notch and walking in and doing it one more time. Young guys scared to death every week. Okay, so a lot of adrenaline going on clearly. Um, so let's go back and talk about your mentor. Um, what was his drive? First off, yeah, what was his drive to do this? But how did he end up getting into it? Well, uh, great question, Al. Uh, he, he was raised a really poor young man in northern Idaho. 
And uh, what happened was he uh, uh, didn't like the lifestyle he was raised with. So he moved to San Diego. He won a trip to Las Vegas on a radio question. Uh, naming the first three presidents of the United States. His hat was drawn out of a hat. He went to Las Vegas for a week, read a couple of books before he left, playing blackjack as a business and turning the tables on Las Vegas. And when he got there, he practiced some of the strategies. The man was really smart, near photographic memory. So he uh, ingested the strategies before he'd went and went over there and lost all his money. And when he came back, uh, he didn't like the way the casinos fed free alcohol to the gamblers. And, um, and basically, once a person started winning, they tried to show them the door. And if they were losing, they fed them more alcohol. And this really tweaked him. He was raised in a religious community, although he was not a real religious man. Uh, but the upbringing just thought that was wrong. And he actually trained us with a hatred for casinos and called them toilets. I can understand that. I mean, I've gone to a few casinos myself, and, and I've seen how they operate. I mean, they are there to make money, and they'll do it any way they can. So um, having the tables turn on them, I can fully understand, and, and I've seen that over the years. Um, so, okay, so the next question is, what happened to all the money you guys won? Well, uh, not to ruin the end of the story, because they're, uh, actually I'm, I'm uh, in the process of writing uh, the sequel to this book. Uh, the book ends by saying, I'll see you guys in Vegas on the 29th of December. So obviously there's another story behind this one. This is about five years of a 10 year stint. And so this carries on after this particular book. Uh, there is uh, a, a kind of a tragedy toward the end of the story that all the guys had to deal with. And so uh, with that said, I don't want to go any deeper about that. But uh, basically, it's an ongoing story about these group of guys, how they persevered, lived in San Diego on the weekdays as normal folks, and lived a double life on the weekend in Las Vegas as cold-blooded card cheaters. <laughs> <laughs> you make them sound like horrible people. You know, uh, they're really not. Um, I spent a lot of time with the characterization. Uh, these guys were my family, uh, my brothers, my friends. I, I relied on them with uh, with with every bit of my soul to be able to play my position on that particular crew. There were five positions. There's a brain, an arm, a field marshal, a screen, and a runner. And every one of these guys had a different job. Uh, they were always in sync. They talked to each other with their hands. They never acknowledged one another. And uh, they could set up a play and create a sting like nobody else in a casino ever has. All right, so have you made the movie script for it? Uh, you know, I wrote the book as a movie. It's very detailed, step-by-step, uh, scene-by-scene. Scene. Um, and I was hoping, I actually wrote it for a movie, uh, Al. It, uh, uh, that's what I pictured in my mind as I wrote the entire book. Uh, and if uh, you really want to know, I wrote this in 1991. And uh, the book being of uh, such sensitive nature, uh, to any of the casino owners throughout the world, because this uh, way of uh, catching the dealer's whole card in blackjack has never been mentioned. I've been studying this and researching for 30 years, and Las Vegas has never mentioned this group of guys, and they all knew we existed. I've been in the same room with, in the back room, of course, uh, with Metro Anti-Cheater Squad, the Griffin Detective Agency, uh, Gaming Commission, and the casino owners and security staff. So I know that they're all involved and they were trying to catch us. I'd seen them on numerous occasions. They saw me on numerous occasions. Uh, I remember one, one time being handcuffed in the back room, Al, and one of the Griffin agents walked by and the door was slightly open and he stopped and poked his head back in the door and said, uh, oh, hey, Jerry, how you doing? I go, well, Mike, not very well, as you can see, and smiled at him. So it, it wasn't as tense as all the rumors would have it. And there's kind of a reason for that. The transition between corporate America and mafia owned casinos appeared to start to take shape in the late 70s. To me, it seems like the mafia was just hiding behind corporate America and that is still true to this day, but there are corporate America 
uh, uh, a casino owned out there. And so, but I think there's a mix of the two still there today. And I'm kind of stepping out just a little bit actually writing the story. Yeah, I can imagine because you're going to be giving away some secrets on, on various levels and stuff. I do, I do uh, write two ways in the book that they could stop this from ever happening again. Uh, so I tell them how to fix it. Um, and it was our fear the whole time that if the dealer just put their first card down and their second card up, there was nowhere to catch the card up off the table. Uh, looking back up toward it is what we did with a mirror. When they shoved a card underneath the up card is when the mirror would pick the card up. And so they all, any handheld deck shoves the card underneath just like that. But if they, if they just put the, uh, uh, the uh, down card first and then the up card second, they could fix it and stop it from ever happening. But back in the eighties, uh, that's the way it was. And what we knew at the time was that the mafia tactics in the fifties and the sixties and the seventies of all the rumors you hear of uh, grabbing guys that were card counters or, and or card cheaters and taking them out to the desert and beating them up. Well, that was still prevalent, but I think once it turned over to corporate America and casinos were actually getting in trouble for beating these guys up and losing their gaming licenses, that they actually, the threats continued for years, but they actually stopped really beating these small timers up. And the threat was enough at that point because everybody knew the history. Yes, it was. It was a good scare tactic. And trust me, uh, when we did this in our early 20s, we were scared to death. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, we did it. I was a competitive college athlete. The guys that I were with were really competitive people. And we just found another game to play. And that's how we took it. Uh, we were lighthearted guys, good-hearted guys. We were fun-loving guys. But when it was Friday afternoon, we were serious as a heart attack for three solid days and worked our butts off to try to make some money. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? When I look back on it, boy, what how, that could be Amer every American's dream is to go to Las Vegas every week and win $20,000. <laughs> Well, this is a good spot for us to stop, take a break, and let our sponsors do their thing, and we'll be right back. The fifth annual Authors Marketing Event is coming to Granbury, Texas, July 24th through the 27th. Join us and learn from the professionals how to properly market and sell yourself and your books. Go to ame.authorsmarketingguild.com for all the details. That's ame.authorsmarketingguild.com. I'm Rox Berkey. And I'm Charles Brakefield. We're award-winning co-authors, Brakefield and Berkey, of the Enigma book series. There are 10 books in these series, with book number 11 planned for release in January 2020. Each story has a central technology focus ranging from identity theft to cryptocurrency, and now AI wars. These adult techno thrillers pit cyber good guys against cyber thugs across the dark net. In our world, technology is today's weapon of choice. You can enjoy ebook format, paper, or audible. We want your feedback. Until the next story, thank you. Thanks. Well, hello there, my friends. My name is Randy James, independent voiceover producer in the Dallas, Texas area. Available to write and record a 30-second commercial, much like the one you're hearing right now. It's a great way to help increase awareness and exposure to your book title. It's easy to do. Simply call me and we'll brainstorm on a few ideas. And in a few hours, I'll whip something up and send you a digital file ready to use. Remember, call or text me, Randy James, at 214-762-1942. Join award-winning author Ari Brish presenting his book, Lay an Egg and Make Chicken Soup at the Lone Star Festival, a Texas-sized event at the Event Complex in Seguin, Texas on May 30th, 2020. Check out the lineup of authors, artists, and bands at lonestar.bookfestival.network, sponsored by Authors Marketing Guild, City of Seguin, Texas, Dear Texas, IndieLector.store, and HEB. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. And welcome back. This is your host, B. Alan Bourgeois. We are on Indie Beacon Radio, and I have with me Jerry Reed, who has written Heat in the Vegas Night, which is about, well, let's just say some card sharks, um, sharks playing in Vegas um, over a 10-year stint. But you mentioned that there was two 
groups, and they were five years each. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, Al, we had, uh, uh, it was almost an ongoing thing. We had one rule. If you got caught by the authorities and they have your picture, you're done. And so if you were caught with any evidence whatsoever and you went to court, you were done. You could not play with this crew any longer. So that was the number one rule. And the boss did that because he didn't want anybody on his crew to get hurt. And he believed in his heart that everybody got one freebie in that particular town for doing what we were doing. And so one guy would come, I would come in. I was trained because other guys had got scared, lost their nerve, or got caught uh, uh, doing it. Uh, there was a major bus in 1979 at Caesars Palace. Uh, the crew had about $45,000 in front of them. They tackled them. They handed the mirror off just like it was designed. The brain hands the mirror to the runner, and the runner gets out of the casino, and they tackle the brain, don't have any evidence on them. So anyway, uh, that's kind of how it worked. And uh, it went to court, and the judge just said, uh, guys, I can't see where this is against the law. Case dismissed. And uh, so there was a bunch of red-faced Italian folks on the Caesars Palace side and a bunch of smiling Northwestern country boys on the other side. And uh, so that's, that's what thickened the game a little bit. And uh, then they understood. They played for two years with the mirror undetected in Las Vegas until the Caesars Palace bust in 1979. Then there was an article in 1983, Las Vegas Sun, front page print, California 21 cheaters sought block print, one inch print on the front. The caption read, they did it with mirrors. And an ensuing article explained exactly how our team worked. And they didn't catch us until 1990 to stop us. So that actually brings up a couple of questions. One, obviously they did that to warn you to stay away and to also warn anyone else if they were thinking about it. Um, right. They knew what was going on. Um, so the scare tactic, since they couldn't catch you, was there. But there was also that scare tactic, as you mentioned earlier, you were scared to death as a 20-year-old doing it in, in the strip. And the mob was known for beating people up and hurting them and I'm sure killing them in some cases. So that alone, even though it may have altered, as you were mentioning earlier, it went into the corporate aspect. But the fear was always there, wasn't it, for that aspect? The fear never left. Uh, we were trained very, very well. And when I mentioned before casino espionage, we were trained to put forth a facial expression to show other people what you wanted them to feel through looking at you. Not only that, but we were able to read other people's expressions, whether it was a tiny eye movement, a shock of the body, a sudden movement that we weren't used to from this particular person. And that's how our guys were able to get away with it. We, we became experts at reading people's faces and reactions to the point where we can actually stimulate someone and force a reaction from them right in the pit. For hmm. example, if a guy was staring at you and you could see him out of your peripheral vision, if you stuck your finger up your nose and picked your nose and he was still looking at you, you had a problem because nobody watches somebody pick their nose. So he's going to turn his head if he didn't have another reason to be looking my direction. So things like that to render a response from somebody. And so we were taught these techniques to run out of a casino at full speed in the first corner, stop, find two people, get right behind them, smile and talk with your hands and watch the people come around the corner and run right by you. <laughs> <laughs> And so we were taught some things, and, and these are all uh, incorporated in the individual chase scenes and the stories of, of the book, Heat in the Vegas Night. Um, it starts off with a chase scene in the very first chapter in the Mint Casino downtown, scared us to death going in, and then the bad thing happened, and the guy points at you and says, grab that guy. Well, the chase was on. And so uh, that's how the book starts out. It continues on with that and explains how the regimen of training went through. It's not a how-to book or a uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of mathematics in it or strategies. It touches on all that a little bit, but not very much. It's a it's a continuing saga about a group of young guys. Just like I said, every weekend you had to cinch up the belt one notch, take a deep breath, and here we go again, and walk in the door and do it. it wasn't magic. <laughs> so when you guys were done from the, the weekend event, okay? 
did you just go home and collapse or, you know, how, how long did it take you guys to really recover to be able to get into your normal life? Well, we, we were all single at the time. Uh, none of us were married. And this is the core crew. Uh, I, I want to mention that a core crew is four guys that went every single week. And that was a brain, a, a field marshal, a screen and a runner. The arm was the high roller. So he bet large sums of money. Uh, anywhere from 500 a hand was our base bet to anywhere from 500 to 2,000 a hand. And we tried to play three hands. So what we did actually was go to the table, set up a play, put a mirror on the table, and then call all the people over there to watch us play. Pit boss included. So the high roller made a big scene. And of course, he had his job to pick the guy's eyes up when the time was right and all this kind of stuff. So it was a real setup because once the high roller hit the table, all the pit bosses came over to watch because he's playing large sums. And so uh, with that said, at the end of the weekend, we called it breaking the BR, which was the bank roll. And so whenever we got close to 20,000, us young guys were going, come on, boss, let's break it. And that meant get paid and go about your business. So we would get around the hotel room. We had it. We kept a tally sheet of every single play we ever made and kept track of the casino, the dealer, the time we played and how much money we won or lost and how many mistakes we made. So we had a sheet to go off of to pay everybody the percentage that was allotted to them for each position. A brain made 25%, a runner made 5%, screen made five, field marshal made 10, and so did the arm. And so they got paid different increments and the boss made 50%, took off the top. So uh, what we do is to break the BR, everybody had their own personalities and different things to do. So some of us took flights back to San Diego and uh, just laid around all day Monday and just trying to recuperate. By Tuesday, Tuesday evening, we'd want to go out. We're young guys in San Diego. We'd go out to a local tavern and play pool and, and uh, drink some beer, things like that for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then Friday morning came and we'd wake up and look at each other and just a shock would cross our face knowing the boss would be calling here in a couple hours to go back to Vegas. <laughs> couldn't have a girlfriend when you told them you went to Vegas every weekend and couldn't tell them what you did. They didn't hang around long. Yeah, I'm sure. So you mentioned you have um, two more books coming out of this, the sequel and the prequel. Um, yes. And you're working on the sequel next, is that correct? Yes, uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish uh, the main story. Uh, I started the, this, the first book, Heat in the Vegas Night, when I was introduced to the crew. And they had been working for three years prior. And the history of the boss getting into where he landed and how he developed this whole system would be the, would be the prequel. So the, the, the sequel is going to be uh, 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 a story, a continuing saga, uh, basically, and how we kept training and losing guys along the way. Uh, but um, the life expectancy or the career expectancy of the brain, the guy who actually did the dirty work, was one year. Well, I carried on and did it for nine years. And uh, so uh, the stress factor didn't get me. I'm still kicking. <laughs> It's pretty crazy to go through all of that. Um, we have just about a minute left. Um, when do you plan on having the second book out? I hope to have it done by the end of the year. Um, I'm going to retire next month. I've been in the uh, road building construction industry for the last 30 years, uh, corporate secretary, project superintendent, project manager, and uh, have built quite an honest reputation in my hometown. And recently I just let the cat out of the bag that I cheated at blackjack for 10 years in Las Vegas. So I'm uh, dealing with a little bit of uh, repercussions, but not much. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, being that far back, it's not that big of a deal in some respects. No. But you're probably getting a lot. Thank you for watching or listening to Indie Beacon Radio. Our sponsor, IndieLector.Store, is the only bookstore that pays authors their fair share for book sales. Help authors to succeed and enjoy a great book by supporting them at IndieLector.Store. Enjoy a 10% discount with coupon code shopper20 at indielector.store. Coupon valid until December 31st, 2020. That's indielector.store, coupon code shopper20. What would you do if you had to put your life on hold to care for a loved one? I'm Charlotte Canyon, award-winning author of the book, You Have to Laugh to Keep from Crying, How to Parent Your Parents. That was a question I had to ask myself some 16 years ago and you'll have to ask the same question. I had a father-in-law with dementia, a mother with Alzheimer's, and a dad with Parkinson, all at the same time. 
We Fiction is a fun, fast pass writing contest for any author team to create a book based on what readers submit for plot, characters, locations, and even plot twists. Learn more about this unique contest at wefiction.dearindy.org. Authors Marketing Guild is a membership-owned organization designed to help authors succeed and learn how to better market and sell themselves and their books. Join us at authorsmarketingguild.com and receive so many benefits you'll wonder why you didn't join sooner. That's AuthorsMarketingGuild.com. Welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. Don't forget to like us, follow us, or subscribe to one of our many channels. Now, here is your host for today's show. And welcome back to Indie Beacon Radio. We are talking with Jerry Reed, who has written a book called Heat in the Vegas Night. It's book one of a three-book series. Um, Jerry... Obviously, you know, it's a fascinating story and we want people to read it. So how can they find the book? Well, the book is on, uh, listed in all the major booksellers, uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble, um, Target, and some of the other majors. Um, we can, uh, you can find the book. Uh, I'd rather have you get it on Amazon. I don't have a shipping thing yet, but I do have a website. It's uh, jerryreedy.com. And uh, the uh, email address, if you need to get a hold of me uh, for any reason, any questions, uh, uh, any leads of some type, uh, I'd kind of like to do more podcasts if uh, they're out there. And uh, uh, so uh, you can get a hold of me at, right on the title of the book. It's Jerry Reedy at heatinthevegasnight.com. So you can get a hold of me with that. And again, that's J-E-R-R-Y-R-E-E-D-Y at heatinthevegasnight.com. Okay, so it sounds like you have two different websites there. One is Heat in Vegas web, Night. Yeah, one's a website and one's an email address. Okay, so the correct um, website for people to check out where you're going to be and, and activities and all that stuff is... Yeah, uh, www.jerryreedy.com. Okay, I want to make sure we get the right ones for the right people and stuff. So um, with those two books lined up, ready to go, are there other stories and ideas you know, rattling through your brain that you want to work on? Certainly. I've, uh, I've been very fortunate. I've had quite an exciting life. Uh, I've boxed in front of 3,000 people in a So You Think You're Tough contest and uh, – I'm an avid archery hunter, and I've uh, harvested five uh, pretty good-sized bull elk with my bow and arrow. Um, I was a college baseball player. Uh, play, I was an All-American baseball player. I played in, an, in a team called Clarinda, Iowa, in the Midwest uh, with some uh, people that are still in the big leagues today. Uh, so I've had quite an exciting life. I've had some very uh, exciting hunting adventures, and there are other things that I would like to write. and. Uh, I'm going to be a nonfiction writer. I'm going to retire and write books. Sounds good. And with that in mind, obviously you have something to draw. You have a lot to draw from to write these three books. But do you have any um, words of encouragement or advice for someone who's thinking about writing their own, their own books? If you have a passion to write a book, sit down and write it in your spare time. Because... It took me 30 years to write this book. Um, I did put it on the burner. I raised a family for 18 years of that. And I shouldn't have. I think I should have done it 10 years sooner. And so if it's, on, if it's forever on your mind, keep chipping away at it. Get some help if you need to. Uh, but keep chipping away. I edited this book 20 times myself. That's a lot of editing. It is a lot of editing. Well, it's my first book and I wanted to make it right. <laughs> <laughs> all right well i thank you very much for your time and effort today um it is a fascinating story and, and i can see how it's going to need at least three books to get through it and stuff so i hope you get a chance to make it into a movie it sounds like something similar to oceans 11 but a little bit more um daring is the word i'm going to use for that i believe um, you're correct <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you again for joining us, and we wish you the best of luck. Great, Al, and thanks, everybody, for listening in. 
Thank you for listening to Indie Beacon Radio, where creative souls can find help in marketing their creations. To learn more about Indie Beacon services, to be a guest on the show, or to advertise on our show, please visit our website. Indie Beacon Radio with the host, B. Allen Bourgeois. Indie Beacon Radio is produced by B. Allen Bourgeois for authors Mark and Guild LLC, copyright 2020. Voice over by Randy James, Lydia Bello, and B. Allen Bourgeois. To be a sponsor of the show or for more information, please email us at info at authorsmarketingguild.com. To be interviewed for the show, please complete the form at radio.authorsmarketingguild.com. Music Always Rejoice by Ram Cord.